The book of Haggai was written around 520 BC. At least that's when most of the events occurred. And we always say around about circa 520 because, as you know, dates are heading backwards when we talk about BC. So it could be between 521 and 520 BC if we want to say that. But we try not to get too hung up on dates. Uh, dates are one of the lesser important things that we focus on when we talk about history and talk about the Bible. But they're significant in other ways such as, okay, prophecy. Okay, so we see that prophecy was going to start at this time and it was going to end at this time and we see that prophecy is fulfilled. So it can still be highly significant. But typically when we talk about these in these commentary style messages, it's because it gives us a certain perspective. It helps kind of organize things and put them in a chronological order. So here we are, 520 BC, and when we start understanding the way that the empires, uh, in particular the image in Daniel, where it had the, the head of gold and then the, the breast of silver, well, the head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, and then it mo moved down into the Medo-Persian Empire. So we know that the empire fell in 539 BC. So here we are, we're, we're in this time of the end of the Babylonian Empire and the beginning of the Medo-Persian Empire. And we also know then that was at the time that uh, Judah was then allowed to go back to the homeland, to Jerusalem. Of course, uh, the rest of the northern tribes never went back. They were scattered and they went off into northwest and in, into Europe. So what we have here, though, by placing Haggai, the book of Haggai, around 520 B.C., is that we are in this restoration period, this reformation period, where the Jews are coming back to the homeland, and they are now, they've been given a mission to go back and resettle and build the temple again. And of course, Cyrus, who was prophesied to do all these things, allowed them to go and do that. And we'll get into that just a little bit more here in just a second. So we have then Haggai who comes on to the scene and again in terms of a prophet and he's going to be the one that's going to be delivering this, these messages. Now Haggai means festive or festal one or my feast. Again, these names are not always exact and we can't always go back in history to find out exactly you know, what it was and what it meant. But, uh, you know, commentaries go out and they say, okay, well, they, they say that this is what it means or probably means. But one of the more significant aspects of this, and the reason that we're even looking at it, is that God often calls things as though they are. And they, he puts meaning. And we've seen that in other messages, like Malachi, the messenger. You know, he brought these five different messages. Well, what is it then that we are to discern from Haggai? And to me, one of the more significant things, and the name I think a lot of us are familiar with, uh, hak, what you know, we're kind of spelling it H A G, but we used to say Hak Sameach, and it was this feast. We we get the word feast from that, so I think we can see that in there. But what we're seeing though is that his message is one of the restoration of the temple, the the rebuilding of the temple, and around the temple is the focus of the the feast, and so we can kind of make that correlation there and without getting into it into great detail, and perhaps we'll do this at a later time anyway, is, is put some of these things together in terms of what this means for us today and, and for the future from the time when Haggai was writing it. So, of course, Haggai is not the focus of the message. He is one of the messengers, and there's not a lot known about him. But uh, Ezra does refer to him in Ezra 5, verse 1, and 6, verse 14, where he's mentioned actually by name, and he's called a prophet. And I think there's some other references in another prophecy where uh, he, he is referenced as you know that prophet that was one of the prophets that was talking about the rebuilding of the temple. So outside of that, you know, he's the only Haggai that's mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, he was a contemporary to Daniel and Zechariah. And he was around during the time of, of Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah. So you, you get these things. It gives us a certain amount of perspective. And I do encourage you to go back at some time, perhaps between this message and the next, and read Ezra. Ezra really goes through and it fills in a lot of the, uh, the backstory, as it were. And it tells what's going on. And we can start putting these pieces together 
And that's the way we are to interpret the Bible as well. Anyway, a little here, a little there. But uh, we will be re referencing Ezra, I think, uh, quite a bit here as we go on to, uh, in terms of this background portion of the book of Haggai. So we have in 539, going back, Babylon falls to the Medo-Persians. Well, then we have Cyrus who comes, all right, as a leader of the Persians, and makes this proclamation around 538 BC. He makes this decree that later Darius I would allow them to do, which would be to return and worship their own God. And it wasn't uncommon for leaders to, in these types of empires, to allow people to go back or to remain in a conquered land and kind of govern themselves as long as they were going to be reasonable about it. So they felt that rather than be oppressed and to have to put big armies everywhere, kind of let them rule themselves as long as they're going to be good. And if they weren't going to be good, then you know, obviously that could become problematic. And I'm not talking just specifically about the Medo-Persians. The Romans kind of did this as well that they would allow them to kind of live in peace and harmony. If you want to look at Ezra 1.1, 1, 1, we see this. Ezra 1.1 1, 1 through verse 3. Again, putting all this together to show the background uh, of what's going on here before we enter into the actual verse-by-verse -verse commentary. So Ezra 1.1, 1, 1, and you'll probably want to keep a, a marker in Ezra, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. And again, what we have to do, we do have to note, is that God, though he works primarily with his people, he's working with the world as a whole to bring about prophecy, to fulfill what he said is going to happen, and to allow these things to happen, not just back then, but even now, and even more particularly now, as we head into the end time, the end days. So we have here that you, we see that Jeremiah was prophesying about this and that the Lord then stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and was a vast kingdom and also put it in writing saying that thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. And I always find that interesting as well, that there's this recognition among Cyrus, as well as uh, Nebuchadnezzar you know, came to learn this as well, that it was God, the, the true, the one and true God, that had given them this position, had set them up. And we know this. I mean, you go through Daniel and God sets up kings. Again, this all falls in line with the fact that God has his finger on the events, the pulse of what's going on, so that he knows. I mean, if a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without him knowing, he knows these big things that are going on. And he's keeping them in check or allowing them to happen according to his purpose. He's got a whole bunch of balls in the air that he's juggling, and he's going to make sure that they all continue to fall in the right place. And it, again, back to the interesting part is that even Cyrus knew this, that God had given him this kingdom. And he said, and he, speaking of God, has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all of his people? May his God be with him. Let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. So all very quite fascinating that they recognize that and yet, you know, they aren't a part of that. But he says, okay, he's telling the Jews, okay, because of decree by God, I'm going to decree this because I'm the leader here now of Persia, that you may go back to uh, Jerusalem. You know, so they've been in captivity and it's been for 70 years, and we'll see that here in just a bit. But he says, okay, you get to go back. And then if you want to look over and in, in Ezra 2, verses 64 and 65, you see that it was about 50,000 of them that went back, and this is around 536 B.C., all right, after the, the uh, fall of the Babylonian Empire and the taking over by the Medo-Persian, that 50,000 approximately went back with Zerubbabel. 
So there's this long list that it goes through, and if you add it up, it's 42,360. And then there were the male and female servants that were about 7,337. And they had, again, the 200 men and women singers. So about 50,000 of them went then back to Jerusalem. And then there were a couple of little minor uh, exoduses later on, back as you progress towards you know, 0 B.C., that around 457, there was about 2,000 that went with Ezra, and then several thousand with Nehemiah uh, in 445, about 12 years later after that. So that was the, the migration, the exodus of them out of that area back to uh, Judah and Jerusalem area. And so they started, when they got back, they started to rebuild the temple. All right, and But then they stopped for about, it looks like, 16 years Again, I'll say about because the numbers can be can vary, and some of this stuff is does not seem to be super exact. But there was a period of time there, 16 years, whether it's 10 years or 16 years, they stopped working on the temple for a considerable amount of time. In Ezra 3, let's look at verses 11 through 13. Ezra 3, verses 11 through 13. And we see that they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads and fathers and houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard from afar. So we see then that they began to build it. Interestingly as well, some of them had actually seen the temple before, before it was destroyed at the time of them going into captivity. They saw it, and we call it Solomon's Temple. And they come back and they see this, the foundation being laid, and they go, wow, this is nothing like what it was back then. And so some of them cried kind of for themselves, presumably, because they seen what they had, and it just hit them hard. That, And again, they had to have been pretty young when they saw it because they were off in captivity for 70 years. And, and now they're looking at it, it's just kind of a shadow of its former self. And so they got to this point, though, is the point here, is that they laid the foundation. But if we move on into chapter 4, we see then that the Samaritans, who were living north of Judah there, and had, I think, come back out of the captivity with the Assyrians, or the Assyrians had placed them there uh, when they were uh, in control of, of Israel, and the Samaritans, who were in this area, wanted to come and help, but when they didn't want them to help, then they, they caused even more problems. And we'll see this in Ezra 4 and verse 1. Ezra 4 and verse 1, and we'll read down through it and then um, skip through some of these other parts here in this chapter. But it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel was a, a civil leader. He, he was kind of like a governor. You know, he was a, a, a manager in that way of the civil activities as opposed to the religious. But nonetheless, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Now, without having done the research, you know, you have to doubt what their motives are and that they were truly actually uh, doing this, that they were godly people up there. But they came down, and Zerubbabel, you know, wasn't going to have any of it. He thought better of it. And Rightly so, as you'll see, their true character comes out here in just a bit. Verse 3, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua, the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel, said to them, 
You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So he puts that in there that, hey, this is what Cyrus said we could do, and that's what we're going to stick with. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building. So they immediately became problematic. Well, if we can't do it, and you know, if we can't get in on this, then you know, we're sour grapes. We're going to go ahead and make life difficult for you. And they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In verse 6, so they, they go down, they write it in the Aramaic script, and they wrote it against, this letter against Jerusalem. And they begin to make all these accusations, and they, they're making it up, and they're trying to put together this uh, case, as it were, to say, here's why you shouldn't do this, here's why you should make them stop, here's what, here's what they're really doing when they do these things, and they were making and imputing all these motives and casting accusations against them and saying, well, look, if you let them keep doing this, they're going to become rebellious, they're not going to pay the taxes or the tributes, and you're going to start losing money, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so because of this, all right, it, you can just read that through all of that and, and all the way down to the end of uh, verse 24, and they accomplished their purpose. Okay, he says, the work of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, ceased. It was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Again, I say Darius. It could be Darius. I've heard it pronounced both ways. I'm just going to say Darius for lack of uh, anything exact. But we have this then that their, their purpose was thwarted by this uh, for a, a time. And... Because of this, they went off and focused on their own things instead. And they continued in that fashion. And this is where Haggai comes in. Right? So what we have with Haggai, we have this theme of the building of the temple. So if you want a, a theme, and, and we'll see this in verse 8, which kind of sums it up for us. But the theme is the building of the temple as well as we'll later see in next time, the day of the Lord. So the book of Haggai, which is only two chapters long, was meant for the people of his day, of his own day, but it's also for later, for when the coming of the Lord. It looks to the future, to a time that's even beyond us today. So his job was to encourage and motivate the people to change. Okay, in, in the sense to repent and to begin building the temple, which is what they were going there to do, what they knew they were supposed to do. Now, this is the second temple. The first one was we talk about is Solomon's temple, which again, you had the tabernacle in the wilderness, which was kind of a foreshadow. And then finally, whenever they, they stopped moving and they were in the promised land, then they had Solomon's temple. And that was built around somewhere between 1,000 and 950 BC, around there but it was then destroyed by the Babylonians. And now we're talking about this second temple, the second temple, which was going to be, you know, considerably smaller and not nearly as grandiose and ornate as the first one. But we'll see then, well, not necessarily in this time, but just as a matter of history, then it talks about Herod and Herod added to this temple, the second temple, which we call the second temple. So uh, Herod's was not the second temple. This is the second temple, and neither was Herod the third temple either. So we want to just keep that straight because there is still a third temple yet to be in the future, which is why I'm you know, making the different the differentiation here. So you have the second temple, and Herod added to it around 19 BC, so a considerable time later here, and expanded on it. And so whenever you talk about that, and don't get that confused, it's just an expansion, addition, an add-on to what uh, was started back here at this time whenever the Jews came out of, uh, of, uh, of Babylon and they left under the Persian rule. So then, of course, then that temple 
it was destroyed in 70 AD and has not been rebuilt since. So what we have then is the Jews coming back and they start around 536 BC. And so in Ezra 6 and verse 15, you see that the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So history gives us a pretty good uh, start or timing of when King Darius reigned. So that's how we get the 520 BC in the second year. He started in 522. The second year is in 521 BC, then 520 BC. That's the second year. And then we get to the sixth year. So when we begin in Haggai, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the timing of the dates there, it's around 520 BC. And then here we are in the sixth year, which is around 516 BC. So finally, they, they end up getting it finished at 516 BC. And so it's going to be another 500 years before Herod adds to it or, or it becomes, quote unquote, you know, the temple that Herod built. So it took them about four years then to build the temple once they uh, continued and got going on it. Now, the uh, let, let's go ahead and just start in, in, in Haggai then, chapter 1 and verse 1. Now that we kind of have the scene set and we have some of the understanding, the history, the background, um, it now becomes Haggai's job to get them to build the temple again. And again, he is the conveyor of the message. And to build the temple, not be concerned with their own things, their own house, but be concerned with the house of God. So beginning in Haggai 1 and verse 1, it says, In the second year of King Darius, and this is Darius the first, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying. So here we have then this first, I mean, very specific. It says the sixth month, first day, second year of his reign. So that roughly equates to the end of August, okay, 520 BC. And if we're correct, it's, this is August 29th when you start doing the, the calculations between the calendars. This is August 29th. And what we're going to have is over the course of the book of Haggai, it, that is going to last less than four months in terms of what his job is here and the messages that he has to pass on. So you have a, a, another second message that we're going to see in Haggai 2 and verse 1. And that happens on the seventh month and the 21st day of the month. And then a third and fourth message that are going to happen on December 18th of that year. And it, that is, corresponds to the ninth month and the 24th day of the month. So there's quite a few uh, dates in here that give us these little markers for how things are progressing and how quickly it progresses. So it's over a relatively short period of time. The only other thing to, of note here is that uh, more than likely Zerubbabel was the nephew of Shealtiel. And without getting into all that, this is not the first time or the only time that Somebody has called their nephew their son, and there are other, other things that were going on that caused that to happen, but not to get hung up on it, he calls him the son of Shealtiel. So this message, even though it was to just, and in, in by name here, you know, these leaders, again, the civil leader and the religious leader, the high priest and the, the governor, it was for all the Jews Okay, this message was for all the Jews, and we'll see that as it goes along. Um, I think Ezra uh, 5.1, did we, I can't remember now if we actually read that one, but in, in Ezra 5.1, it, it said, the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them. Right, so... Ezra says it's, it's to the Jews, and of course it all stands to reason, of course, that the message to them, what was the message for everybody? It went to the leaders, and the leaders were to disseminate it anyway. And as we know, all the words in the Bible are for everyone anyway, so that we're to all learn lessons and profit from it. So again, if you get a chance, go through and, and read Ezra 
and you know it'll help fill in and make some connections here between Haggai and Ezra and hope to do a message on Zechariah here in the near future as well who was also one of these uh, post-exilic type prophets the ones that came out of exile and were prophesying so verse 2 of Haggai thus speaks the Lord of hosts saying this people says the time has not come the time that the Lord's house should be built okay so he knows what the people are saying and why they're saying that they will not finish the temple. Now, we can try to overlay here some uh, human nature into this and, and see that they are making excuses as to why they should not build God, God's house. Whether it was because of the Samaritans and what they had done or not, or, and some have, have supposed as well that, um, that this was because of the prophecy, that they were interpreting the prophecy incorrectly, that they're saying, oh, no, the, the, prophets, the prophecy's not over yet, and so we shouldn't build. Either way, what we're seeing is that they're saying, no, the time has not come yet for the Lord's house to be built. In fact, let's go over to Jeremiah 25 real quick and just have a look at the prophecy. This is the one I was referring to earlier. But Jeremiah 28 20, sorry, 25 verses 8 through 14. Jeremiah 25 verses 8 through 14. Jeremiah 25 and verse 8. So Jeremiah here prophesying says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, or listened to them, or did them, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, against all the nations around, will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of, bride, of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. So you're no longer going to go about life as usual. You're no longer going to enjoy the fruit of this land that flowed with milk and honey. I'm going to bring Babylon and they're going to be a tool in my hand against you to accomplish my person, my purpose because you have not listened to me. And then verse 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So there we have the prophecy. And then verse 12, it says, Then it shall come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon. And that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, same, same peoples, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So again, as often is the case is that when God uses someone to punish his people for the things that they're doing wrong, the, for going against the way of God in, and not living that way correctly, but living it incorrectly, he uses them other peoples and then invariably these people go too far or they get the big head and they think more highly of themselves they don't realize or they forget that God is the one that set them up and that God's the one in charge and they start believing their own press and the next thing you know you know then God says well I'm going to chastise them as well and I'm going to break the bonds that they have on you these bonds of slavery and he did that using the uh, Medo-Persian Empire and so then, verse 13, So I will bring on that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah has prophesied concerning all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall be served by them also, and I will repay them according to their deeds, what we were just saying, and according to the works of their own hands. So what we see then is that uh, Judah's going into captivity, for cause, for a good reason, okay? And he's told them, he told them ahead, ahead of time, if you don't change, if you don't repent, if you don't do what I tell you, if you don't do what I say, 
as a loving parent to his children who knows better, okay, and you're not going to listen, then I'm going to get your attention by punishing you. And then, okay, after 70 years, which is, again, a long punishment, you're going to come back. And I think what we know, too, by following them throughout the future is that it did get their attention. And they did change as much as they could as a carnal, physical nation. And they did try to hold on. They, they no longer tried to, uh, you know, go into idolatry or to Sabbath breaking. And they became very fastidious about that. In fact, they went too far in some respects. But nonetheless, they came back out and they were in Judah after the 70 years were complete. So the 70 years, though, were up, okay, sometime from before. And what some people are saying or postulating is that they were using this as an excuse to not do it. Well, you know, the timing is not up, so we don't have to do that. And so uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 10, you can put that in your notes. It just says, thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you perform my good work toward my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. Well, they had already returned to the place. So I think what it boils down to is that they were making excuses and they were too busy doing their own things and they were focused on their own house, not the house of the Lord. Also, it should go, I should mention that the word should be properly translated house for most of these, uh, these terms instead of temple, okay? But again, they're, they're somewhat synonymous. I think sometimes we get the idea, you know, a different idea in our mind about temple. In fact, even later on in Haggai, in verses 15 and 18 of chapter 2, it does use a different word for temple. But up until that point, I think the New King James Version will throw in temple every now and then. And uh, whereas I think the King James is, is pretty true to it the whole time and uses house or home the whole time. But still, the connotation is the same because it, it talks about the former house. Okay, in the former house being Solomon's house or Solomon's temple. So I, I don't think it's a, a big departure from, uh, and I think that they're being truthful with the translation. But again, just to be, you know, sure for us, for us to know what exactly is being meant. And, and again, the point being is that they focused on their house and not God's house, okay? And again, we'll make some correlations and pull some lessons out of that later. But anyway, the this is all happening, and it's going to happen in terms of this book, just to repeat, within four, uh, less than four months. So from the sixth month and the first day to the ninth month and 24th day. And so we were given those, those markers, as it were, and so I just wanted to point that out. Now, moving on in verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Okay, so here we have God's reply to verse 2. And again, it's the word of the Lord, and that's what we're looking for as, as we go through these different messages that God's giving to Haggai to pass on to the people. It's the word of the Lord. And he says in verse 4, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? Again, Okay, so the word for house here is the same that he's going to use for God's house as well. So he's making this correlation. This panel, this covered, this roofed house, again, they spent their time and effort, energy, money into making their houses uh, really nice and, and sufficient and make perhaps even more than sufficient. And so he says, let me just read that again so we can continue with the rest. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? So he's doing this contrast between the two in terms of the effort and time that they're putting into their stuff and how they're not putting it into God's. So you put your time and effort into your house, but not my house. Now, we need to understand this principle because they didn't understand it. But just to be clear, and, and it's counterintuitive too to the way that God works, at least to the carnal and ungodly mind. God shows us is that if we put the time into what God says that we should be putting our time into and making that our priority, 
then we will actually be more productive in other aspects of our life. So it's counterintuitive, right? If you do what God says, then God will and can bless you in what you do, and the return on what you do will be multiplied beyond what it would normally be. This is the way that God says. He says, basically, that he's going to reward you for doing what's right. This positive reinforcement that a parent gives their children. So now we're going to see how God tries to get this point across and tries to get them to change their focus. He, he brings these, this principle out to show them how it's not working for them because they're not doing things correct and they're not doing it in the right way. So they've been doing this now for a considerable amount of time since they stopped working on the temple. Verse 5, So now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Right? He says, again, this word for consider is, is heart, basically. So the, the, the literal version of the Bible says, set your heart on your ways. So your, your inner part, your inner man, your mind, the way that you reflect, your inclinations, your conscience, okay, set them on what I'm about to tell you here because I'm telling you that actions have consequences. And we're going to see that this is echoed, this consider your ways is going to be echoed like three more times in this, in chapter 2 as well. So we're going to have chapter 1, verse 7, 2.15, and 2.18, and we'll try to point that out as we go along. So here we go. Consider this, he's telling them. Consider your ways. Consider what you're doing here. Set your heart and mind on this, because I'm making a point here. I want you to understand. Verse 6. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages and puts them into a bag with holes. So we see this cause and effect that's going on. This is what we've been talking about, cause and effect here. And this is a thematic message throughout all the prophets. It's that if you do this, okay, and it's not in line with what God wants you to do, then you're going to be, quote-unquote, cursed. If you do this correctly, then you're going to be blessed. I mean, this is Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26, you know, surmised. In fact, let me read Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2 and 15 for you. So Deuteronomy 28, we call it the blessing and cursings chapter, along with Leviticus 26. Verses 1 and 2 tells you one thing, and then verse 15 tells you, the opposite, all right? So, and again, that's how the chapter is divided up. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all the blessings shall come upon you, and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. All right? Do we see that? If you obey the things that I tell you, and I give you these rules for your own benefit. I mean, a parent does not tell their child to not cross the street without looking both ways for no reason. He, a parent tells them for the good of the child. Okay, so now whether the child understands that or not is another story. The child may think at four years old that they are big enough to decide you know, when, they, when and how they should cross a freeway by themselves. That does not mean that they fully understand it. But they take that knowledge and they want this independence from the, the parent, or God in this case, to decide what is right for themselves, to decide what is right in their own eyes. And that's the way it began from the very beginning with Adam and Eve. So he says, though, if you listen... He says, I'm going to set you high above all the other nations, and you're going to be blessed beyond what you can imagine, that more than you can even take in. But, skipping down to verse 15, the converse is true as well. But, and they, they really should capitalize that in all caps and maybe bold it and make it bigger font or something. It says, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, his statutes, which I command you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. 
And then you can go down and read through those and you can see how they're being fulfilled throughout the country, even as we speak. So this is what God's trying to tell them, okay? Cause and effect. Actions have consequences. Verse 7, so because of that, the Lord of hosts says, consider your ways. So he says it again, so twice. You really got to sit up and take notice then, shouldn't you? Plus, I mean, it's God saying it in the first place, but now he's saying it again. Verse 8, go up to the mountains and bring wood, build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. So this is the verse I was mentioning before, and to me it encapsulates this book as a whole, the theme, the tenor, the tone of the book, is that build me a temple, do what I said, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, okay? And you will see that. So this is what God would like them to do. So if he is pleased, then it's going to go well with them. They were to focus on him, on God, and his house. But they were doing just the opposite, as we see here in the next verse. And because of it, they were not blessed. Verse 9, you looked for much, but indeed it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that it's in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. So he's telling them, you went in pursuit of abundance, right? Like we were talking about before. You're sowing a lot, but you reaped a little. He's, so they went in pursuit of abundance, but only found very little in all that they did. Okay, when they, they collected the, the drink, it was not filling. They, the clothes, they did not make them warm. Okay? And when they ga gathered the money, it was like a bag with holes in it that we've seen in cartoons and, and silly movies and things, that the money's just falling out as they walk along, and they're oblivious to it. And it's literally happening, or figuratively happening, in this way where you can't even imagine, you're just going, where where's the blessing. Where is everything going? We sowed much. It's just not yielding like it is. This is where God comes into the picture. If you would just do what you're supposed to be doing, then God would see to it that you were going to be blessed beyond what you can imagine, a hundredfold. But no, what's happening? You found very little. What you did manage to bring home, the little, God blew it away like chaff. Why? Here's the cause and effect. They neglected God and they invested in themselves to his detriment. So in running to their own homes, they were running away from God's house. Right? So are we seeing the contrast here? That they were spending all this time and effort spinning their wheels on their own things, their own pursuits, their own trying to gather in goods, materialism, wealth, and they, <clears throat> and they ignored God. And because of that, they did not, uh, they were not blessed. They could not be blessed. So now we see, and they should be seeing, and it's being brought to their eyes, the cause and effect. In particular, the cursings that come with disobedience. Verse 10 and 11. Therefore, okay, because of what happened before, because of what we're talking about before, the heavens above you withhold the dew, the rain, the water necessary for crops to grow. The earth withholds its fruit. It's not bearing, okay, so that you can reap. For I called for a drought on the land and on the mountains and on the grain and the new wine and the oil and whatever the ground brings forth on men and livestock, and all the labor of your hands. They were spending their time, their effort, they were working their labor, and it just wasn't yielding like it was supposed to. And he says, now do you see why? Now do you know why? I'm telling you why. This struck a nerve with them. The message got across. And beginning of verse 12, we see that they changed. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, 
<clears throat> and Joshua the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. All right, so this is what we were talking about before. The message was initially to the leaders, but again, we saw in Ezra that it was actually to all of them, but that all of them now are responding. Okay, so it was a message for them as well. So with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. All right, what were we talking about in Deuteronomy 28? Okay, again, obedience. This is what God's looking for is obedience. And we'll see here in fear and, and so on. And th again, this, this obedience and fear is a, is a theme throughout the Bible as well. In particular, you see it at the feast time. So they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord, okay, the, the, what Haggai was relating, as the Lord their God had sent them and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Again, respected it, revered him, thought better of, of crossing him, understood cause and effect and actions that have consequences. And so, yay, you know, I mean, this is, it truly is a time to, to be celebratory here, if you're reading this even, because so often throughout the Bible, the prophets, were, it's like they were speak, speaking to a wall. People just did not listen. It was a witness against them, for sure. Okay, and the things happened just the way that God told the prophets to tell the people that it would happen, and it did. And this is why... Israel went into captivity with Assyria, and then Judah went into captivity with Babylon because they were preached to. Okay, well, they came back out of the land, and here we go. We're going to send a prophet to them. We're going to send Haggai as well as Zechariah, and we're going to tell them what they need to do. And they obeyed and feared God. Okay, that's, that's what God wanted. That's what, all they needed to do. And this is one of the few times in the Bible that they actually did what they were supposed to do. And guess what? Verse 13. Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message. So here we go, telling them what they're going to say again. I am with you, says the Lord. How encouraging is that? I mean, that should be incredibly encouraging. When the God that created the universe and all that there is in it and the you know, earth, he created man and everything on it, and all the way up until he you know, parted the Red Sea and all these other miracles that you see the power and the might of God and how he defeats armies in a night and how he defeats cities without ever having to raise a hand against them. Whenever he says, I am with you, how encouraging then should that be and is that? to know that God is now with you and the things that you were doing before incorrectly and the fruit of it is now going to be rectified. You know, they, they were looking at this, okay? They looked at it 70 years ago. Okay, what happened when God's against you? Okay, now he's with you. They knew what it was like to be against. We read that in Jeremiah 25, you know, verses 8 and 9, because they did not listen to the word of God, God was going to bring the king of Babylon against the land, against the inhabitants, against the nations around them. And there was going to be retribution for not obeying and fearing God properly. Again, and, and we're not talking, I don't think I need to go through and say that it's not this improper type of fear, but this proper respect and reverence for God. And knowing that these things, and how these things work and what's going to happen if you don't do them, so now God says, I will be with you. What a relief that has got to be whenever he was against them, when he was a punishing them, when he was trying to get their attention, when he was trying to teach them a lesson. And now he's with them. Now things are going to make better sense since they are going to do what they're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> And it's all happening very quickly here, as we're going to see here in, in the last verse. But verse 14, it says, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, 
and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the year of King Darius. Again, how long was that? From the first day to the 24th, that's 21 days. That's three weeks from Haggai's initial message. And stirred them to work. It didn't take that long. And they reacted quickly and they did not you know, delay they got to the task at hand. I mean, what an encouraging message this is, too. That whenever God is in our lives, or whenever we yield ourselves to God, whenever we do whatever God wants, that things can turn around very quickly when we start focusing on the right thing. So we'll leave it there, and we'll pick up with uh, chapter 2 next time.